You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Dennis Noble. This is the third time I've had him. And out of uh, 2,100 interviews I've done, he's one of only three that's come back three times, and there's good reason for that. Uh, Dennis, uh, he's a British biologist who held the Burden Sanderson Chair of Cardiovascular Physiology at University of Oxford from 1984 to 2004, and then was appointed Professor Emeritus and Co-Director of Computational Physiology. He's a pioneer of uh, systems biology, and he developed the first viable mathematical model of the working heart in 1960. And I'm going to be talking to him today about um, a really cool subject called uh, extracellular vesicles or exosomes. Uh, he has a chapter in a new book that's coming out about the subject and uh, perhaps a few other topics. So, Dennis, thanks again for coming back. I appreciate it. Great pleasure, Rich, to, to come back and talk to you. Yeah, and I hope each time I talk to you, I've, I've learned more so I can ask you better questions. That's, that's my goal here. So. <laughs> well, we all do that, don't we? <laughs> I hope. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, if you don't mind, can you define uh, an exosome or extracellular vesicle? Yes. Um, if you imagine uh, the cell of an organism, a human or an animal or a plant, which is itself a vesicle of a kind, <laughs> what we mean by that is it's a fatty material, which is the cell membrane, um, which then contains all the molecules inside the cell. Now, the inside of the cell is also highly organized into even smaller bits and pieces, all of those surrounded by what you might regard as a bit like a soap bubble. A soap bubble is, after all, a a lipid bubble. And so the exosomes or extracellular vesicles um, occur in the following way. The cell can select some of the molecules inside that cell that can include proteins, it can include DNA, it can include RNA, which controls the protein expression. It selects those and puts them into a very tiny little packet, also surrounded by a membrane. And then it extrudes these little vesicles out through its own cell membrane to the outside, meaning that that information about the state of that particular cell, whether it's a pancreas cell, a liver cell, or a heart cell, is available to be communicated to any other cell that that vesicle meets as it wanders around, and even just random motion will take it from one cell to another. So these are ways in which individual cells in our body can communicate with all other cells in the same body. And the significance of that is that that information is specific, not only to a particular type of cell, whether it's a heart cell, a bone cell, or a liver cell, but also specific to the state of that cell, including, for example, whether it is cancerous or not, And so the messages can include information about the state of a cancerous cell. This is um, 
changing our ideas of the organization of our body and the organization of the bodies of other organisms uh, to an enormous degree, because we used to think that the cells were more or less cut off from each other. That's just not true. They're exchanging information all the time. So these extracellular vesicles are little packets like tiny um, soap bubbles containing the information from the cell itself. Well, if I picture myself as a particular cell inside my body, I must be surrounded by a milieu of millions and millions and millions of different EVs that are coming at me. And how, how am I, how can I tell, Oh, this one's from a bone cell. This one's from a liver cell. This one's important. I mean, how do I process all this incoming info as a cell myself? The, I don't think we really know that kind of information yet. We know that all cells will do this. We know also that the information in the vesicles can, for example, communicate cancerous nature to neighboring cells, which is possibly the way in which a cancer can, as it sometimes does, metastasize, that is spread quickly uh, through the organ. So we know that the information is communicated and is used by other cells, but exactly whether they know this comes from my neighboring liver cell or this one comes from somewhere from my heart or this one comes somewhere from my lung, I don't think we yet know whether individual cells on receiving these can know exactly where they came from. So I believe that's still an open question. What sort of, I mean, if you imagine a telephone exchange, you would have the connections, wouldn't you, as it were, already laid down. Now, we know how that is done inside the cell. There are actually pathways inside the cell that can ensure that a message goes from one part of the cell to another, for example, from the surface to the nucleus. But We don't know whether there are any pathways that could preferentially move the um, extracellular vesicles to particular locations. I think those at the moment are open questions. Do we know um, where in the cell the uh, EVs are made? Is there a special organelle that we've identified that makes them? Yes, they're they're made from the membranes of what is called the endoplasmic reticulum. That's a long word, so I'll just explain it a little bit. Inside all cells, there is a network of um, like tubes of cellular uh, surface material. That is the lipids that form the surface of cells. And those can bud off a little vesicle. So we know where they come from. The question is, how do they get their content to be what they are? Now, we're at the stage now where it is possible to identify what the content is of any given extracellular vesicle. And we do that by putting what are called fluorescent markers down, which will Um, which will attach to very specific molecules. So we will know not only that this particular molecule is, for example, an RNA, but also which RNA it is. Now, how the cell works out um, precisely which molecules to put in which extracellular vesicle, or whether it does all of this at random, just simply selecting what is inside its Uh, cellular structure, it's cellular fluid, um, to produce a typical uh, output of a vesicle, which then just varies in a random way from one vesicle to another. I don't think we yet know. What we can say is that when you visualize these vesicles outside a cell, they appear, particularly when the fluorescent probes are attached to the molecules, they appear like a a whole set of jewels. And I use the word jewels advisedly because they look extremely beautiful. They're like little rings, of course, the vesicles around. 
and you see one molecule colored maybe uh, purple, another molecule cover, covered, uh, colored in a yellowish way, and another one in a reddish way. And the end result is a very beautiful set of pictures of these little uh, gems, as it were, surrounding the cell and moving away from it. Now, that tells you that not all vesicles contain the same, because what you find is that the colors can vary. So that gives us the, the feel that the cell is putting these out, possibly in a fairly random way, but still giving information on the state of that particular cell. But each of the vesicles may contain a different subset of what is in the cell itself. So of, of all the ways that cells can you know, conduct cell-to-cell -cell communication, is this a major way? in anyone's experience or is this just one of the ways or is this like one of the only ways well we already know a lot of processes in which the vesicles have been shown to play a role for example um, a vesicle from one cell will uh, or a cell that contains its own kinds of vesicles may attach to a particular surface, a particular tissue, for example, and proceed then to move along the tissue. In other words, just by normal cell movement, proceed to move uh, in, say, a particular direction. Now, what it does is to put out vesicles containing what are called uh, adhesion molecules. These are proteins that enable cells to attach to another part of the body or to another cell. Now, what that does is it creates a kind of track of adhesion molecules, which other cells can then follow. So <clears throat> in that way, you can have um, exosomes essentially controlling directional movement. In fact, I'm looking at the moment at one of the articles in Nature Communications, one of the major nature journals, and the title says it, directional cell movement through tissues is controlled by exosome secretion. Now, if you imagine a cancerous group of cells metastasizing, this can be one of the ways in which they do it and can do it sometimes very quickly. Uh, cancers, of course, grow notoriously at very different rates. Some are extremely invasive and those are extremely dangerous. And some do so very, very slowly. But what these studies have given us is better, a better idea of how sometimes the process can be really very fast indeed. So there's one example of the way in which um, the spreading of a tissue and particular types of tissue can occur in particular directions. Um, you can also show that, for example, taking tumor cells, those cancerous cells from a breast, will uh, pour out um, the cell adhesion molecules and facilitate the spreading. That's, again, one of the mechanisms by which a breast cancer can spread. So, we already have examples of how <clears throat> these vesicles are capable of function in the sense that they can direct both the uh, direction and the speed with which that kind of spread of influence can occur. Now, the question that fascinates me, and which incidentally is not dealt with very much by other than me and a few others at the moment, is... Can this information also be communicated to our germ cells? And we know that it can. Uh, that's been shown by some very elegant work in a laboratory in Rome run by a man called uh, Professor uh, Spadafora. And what he's been able to show is that not only do sperm and egg take up uh, extracellular vesicles and extracellular DNA and RNA, they can also incorporate it then into the egg cell um, fluid and even incorporate the DNA that comes from another part of the organism or indeed in one of the experiments done by Spadafora's laboratory from a different species. So we do know 
that another important function, uh, excuse me a moment, just a bit of water. No problem. Yes, we <clears throat> also know that another function, potential function of these vesicles is the communication of information down to future generations. Now, that even a few years ago was a heresy. It was thought to be impossible for the germline uh, the germline cells, the uh, egg and sperm, to be influenced by the rest of the body. We now know through the work on exosomes and even on the passage of uh, simple naked DNA in the extracellular fluids that that idea of the germline being completely uh, protected from any influence from the rest of the body is simply not true. And we now know the mechanism. A surprising fact is that this was thought of as an idea as long ago as the 19th century by Charles Darwin. He, he couldn't see anything, of course, that could correspond to our extracellular vesicles, but he certainly postulated that they might exist. So he saw the significance from the point of view of transgenerational information being passed on. We're now seeing the mechanism that he postulated. So I think there's no doubt, uh, to answer your question, do these extracellular vesicles have function? They clearly do. There's so much still to be found out, though. And in particular, uh, how can we use all of this information for better diagnostics? Can we, for example, get a much earlier uh, diagnostic tool for cancerous development uh, or indeed the development of other forms of disease, uh, even, say, um, Alzheimer and other forms of old age problems? Can we get that kind of information much earlier when it would be easier to intervene, easier to uh, treat patients? That's of course, one of the big issues in the book has just been published. Incidentally, it has now come out. The Elsevier book has oh, appeared. So that is, is now fully out. I haven't yet received a copy, but I can say it's packed with all of this kind of information. But I'm okay. also a little surprised that my, only art, my own article, which is the very last article in the book, is, is in fact the only one that deals with the transgenerational idea. I think many scientists are still hesitant to treat that issue, given that until recently it was quite heretical to suppose that that could happen. Well, uh, when were vesicles first discovered? And, uh, you know, I've heard that they're so small you cannot see them with a light microscope. So well, how big are they? And... Yes. Um, we did once think that you could only see them with the light electron microscope because there is a physical limit to ordinary light microscopy. It's called the Abbe limit. Who's, that's the physicist who long ago, over a hundred years ago, worked out that the way in which light is diffracted by the structuring to which you shine it means that you can't resolve much better than a few hundred nanometers uh, by standard light microscopy. Now, that um, limit has been well and truly breached, and not just to a minor degree, it's been breached very effectively indeed by new microscopic techniques, which now allow us to use light microscopy to view vesicles as tiny as 10 to 20 nanometers, which is about the smallest that we know them to be. So we now have managed to see them with light microscopy. Uh, I was privileged to be at a meeting here in Oxford uh, in the middle of last week at which eight of the younger researchers in my department in other, and in other departments in Oxford were presenting their evidence using these techniques. Now, why does it breach the barrier? It's very interesting. You remember I said that Abby's barrier applies to light being shone onto a tissue or a cell or an organ to view it under the microscope. But suppose the light could come from the cells or objects themselves. Now, that's exactly what fluorescence marking does. It colors 
a particular chemical and you see it. And because the light is not diffracted by the rest of the tissue, it, it actually can be detected at a much finer resolution. You can take the resolution, therefore, down by at least an order of magnitude. You then get these beautiful images. Not only have you the ability then to um, view them with the light microscope, which we formerly thought was impossible, um, you can even uh, visualize the individual molecules in those vesicles, so you know what is there. Wow. Furthermore, you can see them move. I mean, this is living tissue. You've got a cell that's alive. You've got vesicles that have been pushed out. Now, the vesicles themselves are not alive in the usual sense we mean alive, but they are moving and they are communicating from one cell uh, to another. So the good news is that the barrier to using light microscopy has, over the last few years, been well and truly breached. And I was utterly amazed at the beauty of not just the immense implications for science and understanding of disease and health, but also the sheer beauty of what is being produced as these images of what I describe as like a ring of jewels around a cell with each of the vesicles colored in different ways according to which chemicals are in them. So we are in effect with light microscopy now, even viewing individual molecules, which I I would have thought was utterly impossible just a few years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. Are, are scientists able to tag uh, certain parts of a cell and then literally watch it and see its yeah. inner workings? Exactly so. I, <laughs> you know, it's, it's worth your listeners uh, j- just doing a bit of a Googling for uh, videos of some of these beautiful uh, cell images that people can produce now. I'm just to leave the vesicle issue for a brief moment. You can you can visualize the pathways which I referred to earlier on within the cell that enable communication to occur from a specific part, let's say, of the cell surface and a specific part of the cell nucleus. And they show up as beautiful colored threads according to the nature of the molecule you're using to uh, to to color it. With, with fluorescence. There's a sheer beauty to what people can observe now. So you can do it both for the interior of the cells and for the little particles like the extracellular, extracellular vesicles that are being extruded from the cells. Has anyone tried to do a semi-longitudinal look at a cell and see what vesicles it gives off and takes in over maybe a period of five minutes? That's a beautiful question. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm pretty sure somebody must have done this. It seems such an obvious thing to do. Now, what would be the limits on doing it? You can, of course, only tag fluorescently a modest number of molecules at a given time. So in any given experiment, I think you'd probably find, well, suppose you were tagging five or six, which I I would guess is about the limit of what you can do. I'm not an expert on the way in which the fluorescent tags are uh, are used, but I would guess that you can't do much more than that. Now, that would mean that in a cell containing literally millions of different types of protein, RNAs and DNAs, you know, you, you'd be choosing to look at those five or six that you actually label. You'd have to then redo it with labels for another set of molecules. And you can see that to go through all the molecules there might be, it would take really quite a long time. So although I'm sure the answer to your question must be yes, because there's no reason why with the light microscope, you shouldn't watch the vesicles coming out over a period of minutes or hours even um, and see what they look like. Um, There might be a limit to what you can conclude from this because you will only be um, identifying a very few molecules in any given experiment. But then in terms of in vivo versus in vitro, could you have a scenario where let's say you have a mouse and, you know, its skin has been cut open and certain cells tagged, and maybe a transparent cover placed over the skin, and then the mouse sedated, and then 
you could somehow observe the action of some cells and EVs they put out and take in in vivo. I don't know whether people have done it in vivo. That's that's my guess is that might be easier to do on some very simple organisms uh, like planarian worms that are themselves more or less transparent. And indeed, you can make um, whole organisms like that uh, fluoresce. And nature does that naturally, actually. If you look at beautiful tropical fish that are fluorescing, uh, a neon tetra, for example, or something like that, uh, that's how they do it. And some organisms actually use fluorescent light as a form of camouflage um, to evade uh, predators. So, yes, you certainly can put these tags, fluorescent molecules, and nature does it itself onto living organisms. But to visualize them, you'd need to have a very small organism in order to be able to look at it. I think your idea of, of as it were, doing it in a, uh, say, a more complex organism like a mouse, uh, or indeed even a human, by uh, just looking at the surface skin, well, that's all you'd be able to do. I don't think you'd be able to look much deeper than that without opening the organism up, of course. Well, the reason I ask is that, you know, in the body versus in a dish, or even in an environment that emulates the body, I would think that the cells would act very differently. Indeed. It's not give off, you know. So it's absolutely it's nice right. it. So Yes, and indeed, what I said earlier on illustrates that if you take a cancerous breast tissue out and put it into the Petri dish, it'll start pouring stuff out. And it's presumably, or it is presumed that, it's unlikely to have been doing that quite at that rate within the normal environment in which it found itself. In fact, I, I come to the conclusion, looking at a lot of the issues to do with cancer, that it must be that most of the time our tissues are suppressing cancerous development. Otherwise, what stops them spreading as fast as they can? Uh, so I think it's extremely likely that you're right. If you take the tissue out, and that's been demonstrated I mean, for example, one of the articles that um, came up from the meeting last week, detachment of breast tumor cells induces rapid secretion of exosomes. So, yes, the, the tissue uh, in vitro will not be behaving in exactly the same way as it does in vivo. That's absolutely correct. Now, to what extent we can follow that up with in vivo work I wouldn't be able to comment too much on that. I can see how difficult it would be, except in very tiny organisms like planarian worms. Mm. And then uh, I remember I asked you last time, you know, like we're, we're all holobions. You know, we have a tremendous microbial fraction. Indeed so, yes. EVs would tend to tell me that perhaps our microbes are sending out EVs to us and our somatic cells are sending out EVs to the microbes within us communicating that yes. way. Any yes. evidence there? Well, now, that's uh, th th this comes very close to some of my interests in relation to evolutionary biology because um, we used to think that only the microbes, um, that is, the bacteria and the single-celled organism, could be changing, or exchanging, rather, um, DNAs and RNAs between each other. And we, we knew that they were promiscuous in doing that. Another way to look at the significance of the findings on exosomes is the discovery that, in fact, all cells in the body are behaving just like that. They are promiscuously, if you want to use that word, exchanging information with each other. So in that sense, we are still like a big colony of single-celled organisms, bacteria or uh, similar. Now, can the, the, the vesicles or other material or even just raw RNA and DNA put out by uh, um, bacteria, our own um, uh, microbiome, uh, influence us? Now, actually, the body has some pretty tough barriers to the microbiome getting into the rest of the body. Uh, that, of course, is infection if it happens. And that's why, of course, it's extremely important to try and avoid 
um, that kind of thing happening during operations uh, on people, uh, you, you get sepsis very, very quickly. But um, the question nevertheless has hung over biologists. Can there nevertheless be ways in which sometimes m- material from the microbiome can get through? Now, there are very few experiments that really demonstrate whether that can happen. But it has been demonstrated, for example, that some of the DNA from the microbiome of insects has been capable of getting into the genome of those insects. Now, exactly how that happened um, and what the process was by which it happened, I don't think we know. But the evidence is there for what it's worth, that at least in some organisms, the microbiome can get information through to the rest of the organism. But generally, uh, we think that the barrier to that happening, for example, much in ourselves, is pretty good and would not normally allow such transmission to occur. Okay. We wouldn't survive otherwise. Yeah, I just didn't know how much crosstalk or, you know, if any... Crosstalk, I think we can say it's very small, but nobody could exclude that it doesn't happen. That's a good way to put it, I think. So have have we applied these new light, light microscopy techniques to observe, you know, single celled organisms, bacteria, viruses, et cetera, and seen if they have their own form of, of exosomes that they take well, in and give off? Yes, that's an interesting question. Um, the bacteria have their own way of doing it. <laughs> um, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, when two bacteria are, are within a reasonable distance of each other, in other words, reasonably close, they they put out little tubes, probes, as it were. They're called pili, to give the Latin name for them. Um, little sort of fingers po- poking out from the uh, bacterium to see, as it were, well, is there anything else out there? (laughs) And if they connect, that is, the pili from two bacteria actually meet each other, they do something quite remarkable. They then, as it were, contract to pull the organisms together, and they then, through that connection, proceed to exchange DNAs and possibly other molecules with each other. This is the mechanism, incidentally, what this means, incidentally, uh, is they don't actually need to use the vesicular uh, process. They can actually do it in a much more specific way with one bacterium communicating with another in this very specific way. So it's transmission through a kind of tube that gets formed between them. But what this does do is to give populations of bacteria the possibility of evolving extremely quickly and that's what's giving them resistance to our antibiotics which is a big scare now because we already know of bacteria that can resist practically all the commonly used uh, antibiotics and so we're going to have soon to develop more and different antibiotics if we're going to keep ahead of what they're doing but what I'm saying here is that the, the bacteria, well, not totally sure that they don't use the extracellular vesicle route, but what I can say is they don't really need to because they've got their own special way of doing this kind of exchange of information between them. And going back to, well, actually tying it in, so from what I've read about quorum sensing and then assuming that the cells in our body can do the same and, and then that, EVs seem to back this up and give an even another dimension to it. From what I can see, and I may be totally speculating here, but our cells have some level of cognition because in order for me to send out EVs and take them in, and I have to know I have a self, there's other. Let's say I'm a liver cell. So I have to know that I'm a liver cell and I I have a self. There are other liver cells that are my same type. Then there are other cells that are other cell types that are other, other. And I need to be able to interpret messages and send out specific messages to my type, other type, et cetera. I mean, how, how can that happen? That seems to point to cellular cognition to me. Yes, I, I, I'm inclined to agree with that view now. Um, a number of years ago, I would have dismissed the idea that individual cells have a form of cognition. 
but I've come round to a different view of this. Um, you see, I was I was brought up as a medical scientist, learning by medical science at University College London a long time ago, and in those days, what you could do with the classes using light microscopy was to look at completely dead tissue. And so if, for example, you were shown an amoeba, that's a little microorganism, but not like a bacteria, it's got nuclei and it's got DNA enclosed in the nucleus in the way our cells do. It's like any of the cells of our body in that sense. Anyway, what you see when you look at a dead amoeba is you'll see where the nucleus is, you'll see where the energy factories, the mitochondria are, and so on. And we were taught, of course, to identify all of those locations inside the cell um, in the dead tissue that we were looking at. But when I first, a few years after graduating, saw a video of a moving amoeba, I thought, my goodness, this is a completely different thing from what I thought. It's when you see the amoeba clearly sensing that there's a particle of food within reach, it then coordinates the movement of its um, putting out of these little fingers, as it were, or feet of, um, of, of its own tissue to, in this case, get itself into the position in which you can, as it were, totally surround that particular particle and take it in. Now, it's doing, as it were, a kind of opposite of forming an extracellular vesicle. It's actually vesicularizing. I don't know whether that word exists. But anyway, it is forming a vesicle, which then becomes a vesicle inside itself, if you wish, an endosome rather than an exosome, which it then proceeds to digest. And you can do that with other organisms too, smaller organisms. It can uh, take bacteria in in that way and proceed to digest them. And indeed, we do think that the way in which um, the energy factories in our cells, like mitochondria, originally formed was by one cell type taking in another, one cell taking in a bacterium, which eventually became the mitochondria after years of evolution. So... Coming back to the question of intelligence, you have to say that that amoeba has a form of intelligence. Now, how flexible it is, how plastic it is, uh, those will perhaps be the kinds of questions we have to ask in order to work out, well, how intelligent is it? You see, we have a similar problem with the development of artificial intelligence um, using, of course, silicon computers. Um, We've already got to the point where we can uh, make artificial intelligence that can learn and can learn in interaction with its environment and with, mm. indeed, in interaction with, with humans. So the idea that intelligence has to do with learning is already there in some of the forms of artificial intelligence that have been developed. The question that I think, or the issue that may divide that kind of intelligence, what we might call computer intelligence, digital electronic intelligence in the form of artificial intelligence from a real cell, I think is a further stage of organization, which is what I call the harnessing of the opportunities that occur by random movement or random activity of the material within, in this case, the living organism. Living organisms can do that to an extraordinary degree. And I think it's the basis of the way in which they have achieved this extraordinary degree of plasticity, which enables us to say of that amoeba moving around, it's got a form of intelligence. Um, and I think it's more than the kind of intelligence that has been developed so far by artificial intelligence using digital uh, approaches. I sometimes ask myself the question, in order to really create intelligence that is human-like or is organism-like, would it have to be done not using silicon, but perhaps be done using water? You see, mm, water yes, is an extraordinarily interesting molecule 
it will dissolve almost anything into it other than the fatty components because of course they end up in the cell membrane, not in the main water uh, tissue. But the components inside that water environment are just moving the whole time. They provide a huge amount of randomness for the organism to filter and to use as organisms clearly can to determine the direction in which they will move or proceed uh, within their environment. Now, it could be that the degree of intelligence of the kind we would call human intelligence simply can't be achieved by silicon. It may be that the future for developing um, intelligence of the kind we commonly talk about when we're talking about humans and animals um, really would require that we try to do it using um, water-based material. But then I think to myself, well, that means you're actually trying to reconstruct the living tissue. And I don't know how long that might be away in the future, but it's certainly not going to occur very quickly and it's certainly not going to occur very soon. Now, I don't know whether this is good news or bad news. If I'm right, it's good news for humans in the sense that it's going to take absolutely ages for um, artificial intelligence to develop to the point at which we could trust it with, for example, um, determining what to do in an impending crash in a motor car, to think of motor cars that are not driven by us, but by artificial intelligence. Um, And that's the criterion, it seems to me, for that kind of intelligence. Could we trust it? Could we be giving it agency in a legal sense? At the moment, we clearly can't. So I'm inclined to now return to answering your question. I'm inclined to think that those cells have a sense of self. They do have intelligence that's pretty impressive. And coming back to the amoeba that I watch um, circling around, a piece of food and ingesting it. Uh, it, It's very difficult to watch all of that happening without thinking that it has got intelligence. Goodness me, if we give intelligence to a computer-based system, then we should certainly give it in the right sense uh, to the amoeba. But moving on to the much bigger question, uh, what do we think about human agency, meaning agency that be, can be given legal responsibility? <laughs> That's the big issue. I, I think we're absolutely a huge long way away from being able to reproduce that, even though I know that artificial intelligence people have done some very impressive things with deep, uh, deep learning methods, for example, uh, yeah. creating even a certain degree of creativity in the way in which, for example, an artificial intelligence can create a picture. Whether it going, could, going, is another matter. <laughs> well, yeah, going, going back to the cells, though, um, <clears throat> in order, again, to manufacture specific EVs and interpret them coming in, and et cetera, I mean, that tells me there's a whole language there. How yeah. do you know, as a cell, what to put in your EVs, what think, to target... Yeah. What etc. I, I mean, there has to be a language. Yes, that must be so. Though at the moment, I don't think we have much idea of what exactly is determining the content of those EVs. Yes, that's the the big question. I think, and as I said earlier on, I think it's possibly going to be difficult to work that out because um, we can only visualize a few molecules at a time. Uh, I mean, part of that is determined by the limit even of the modern methods of light microscopy that have taken us down to the nanometer scale and the ability to visualize individual molecules. What we're actually visualizing there, incidentally, is the light that's coming from them. (laughs) We're not, as it were, able to see uh, the molecule in the way in which a a molecular model can be seen. So we don't get to know its detailed structure, but we can identify what it is as a molecule and therefore know what its structure would be if we could make it. So I think the difficulty is going to be that you can, you can only colour a, a small number of things at once, otherwise you'll get a complete mess. You get, In fact, in the limit, you'd get white light, wouldn't you, if you had all the colours of the rainbow mixed together. Well, that's a bit of a, uh, of a fantasy. But no, seriously, 
the, the methods that are being used would require that you limit yourself to a modest number of molecules at any given time, and then uh, you're going to have to work out, if it's possible to do so, what intelligence there might be in the cell that could create the the molecules or the vesicles that it, as it were, now to use an intelligent uh, uh, ascription, wants to put out, as it were, from its sense of self, as you put it. Um, well, I, well, the difficulty with all of this is that we don't fully have the language, do we? We we have never generally thought of ascribing intelligence to such tiny things. Now that we perhaps have to, we've got to work out this language rather carefully. Well, another thing that occurs to me, you know, I, I thought about, let, let's take people. So I think 120 billion people have ever existed, and most of them have, you know, a liver and a pancreas, etc., but in all those people, their livers and pancreases are similar shape, similar size, similar position to each other, etc. Where is that knowledge? And for instance, where is the knowledge of exosomes? And where is, where is all this knowledge kept? I don't know if it's kept in the DNA or is it kept somewhere else? It just seems like there's this, I don't even know what you'd call it, this, uh, yes. the, this cellular some... literacy. Where, is this, where does it exist over it's time and space? Um, first thing to say on that, I think, is that um, time of the year when allergies happen. Um, yes, the first thing I think to to say about that question is that it isn't possible for it all to be in the DNA. There isn't enough information. Um, now, we know that for another reason, which is that we don't only inherit just our DNA. We inherit the whole egg cell combined with the sperm cell. So... All organisms are transmitted to the next generation, not by DNA alone, but by a huge organization, which is the cell. Now, to give a feel for this, if I represented a molecule like DNA at the thickness, say, of my fist, the edge of the cell, well, here I am in Oxford, England, which is down in the south of England. The edge of the cell on that scale would be way up in Scotland, up in the north of the country. <laughs> you know, to give a, a, a similar American example, if, if my DNA is on that scale represented as being in Boston, then... Uh, you know, the edge of the cell is at least as far away as New York and possibly further. It all depends on the size of the cell. Now, what that's telling us is this. The volume of the cell that is attributed to our DNA is very tiny. The great majority of that volume, which is passed on from one generation to another, is the rest. Now, I once did a calculation. If you could image a cell at, let us say, the roughly 10 nanometer level of resolution down, in other words, to the very tiniest objects you can find in cells, uh, like the vesicles, um, what would be the total information in that image? It's at least as great as the genome. You can easily show that it would be billions uh, of, of, uh, of bits if you were trying to digitize it. The point is we inherit all of that. So I think part of the answer to the question, um, could it be in the DNA, all of it, a lot of it is, obviously. The DNA is extremely compact information. But all the rest, which is distributed through the rest of the cell, is necessary for us to be able to pass anything along to a future generation. And I think we've tended to ignore that as though all cells are much the same. Well, we know they're not, of course. And the, the cells from you and the cells from me are not exactly the same. So I think we've got to now realize that the cellular inheritance, as we would call it, is also extremely important. Now, that doesn't answer your question, which was how does it come about that everybody has a liver of a particular shape, everybody has a kidney of a particular shape, everybody has a brain of a particular shape. Of course, that's the great uh, problem of embryonic development and what uh, enables it to happen. Um, 
All I can say is that it seems to me that it has to happen as a consequence of an interaction between the genome and the rest of that cell structure. Um, it's a fascinating process, and we can describe it in very high detail, uh, as embryologists do. But to say that we really know exactly how it happens, that uh, a liver differentiates, that a uh, kidney differentiates, that a brain differentiates, yes, we can, in a sense, we can say where it came from within the embryo and how the embryo buds these different components off as it develops. But to ask the question, where is the plan, to come back to your question, where's the intelligence to do all of this, I think we're still struggling to work it all out. And I, I wonder even how it's going to be possible to work it out in a fully satisfactory way. And I say that because of calculations that I did years ago on just how many options there are for interaction and therefore for potential forms of development in any system containing, well, at the time I did it just on the basis of calculating just the genes, say 20 or 25,000 genes. And it turns out to be more options than there are particles in the universe. So we have a major difficulty, which is the combinatorial explosion problem. Cells have so many molecules in them, so much structure. They're not just simply smooth interiors with no structure. They're highly structured. Um, that I, I think it's going to be a long time indeed before we work out the answer to that question. How does uh, everyone's liver look the same, roughly? Everyone's kidney look the same, roughly? I don't think we're anywhere near a good answer to that kind of question. Yeah, and they have the same orientation to each other. One's across from another. You yes. know, they have the similar size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Organization too. Of course, we do know that sometimes it can go wrong. You can sometimes right. double-headed embryo or um, uh, somebody completely missing an organ, which usually means they don't survive. Um, so, yes, it can go wrong. But, but most of the time, the extraordinary thing is that it, it, it goes right. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dennis, uh, you know, I, I could talk to you for a very long time, but I know your time is valuable and you're over in England and with daylight savings, it's getting late. So yeah. any... Um, Already completely uh, dark, yes. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so um, for people that are list have listened and are curious and want to know more, what are some resources for them to go from here? Yes, I... Well, first of all, um, I think that uh, the book that just come out by Elsevier, um, it's actually changed its title slightly. It's now called Exosomes, a Clinical Compendium. It was originally called, in its proof form, Exosomes in Health and Disease, but it's now called a Clinical Compendium with just the title Exosomes. That is now available and is published by Elsevier under their um, uh, mark of academic press. Um, but I'm also pretty certain that if you... Uh, Google exosomes and exosome videos, I'm pretty certain your listeners would pretty quickly find some of the extraordinarily beautiful images that I've been talking about, and particularly the beautiful coloured images when the exosomes and the cell itself is coloured by fluorescent molecules which attach to uh, particular molecules, or indeed have got parts of their structure change to be fluorescent. So those would be two of the ways in which your listeners could um, uh, access this. And I'm also very happy for your website to put any of the references that I sent. I sent a number of uh, Thank you. articles that are a way in um, just to give an example, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, just five years ago, published Extracellular Vesicles Biology and Emerging Therapeutic Opportunities. Well, there's uh, a, a possible way in for those who are interested in pharmaceutical and similar developments that could uh, be based on exosomes. Um, so 
there's, there are many ways now in which one can proceed to access all of this. And I'm also very happy to pass on to you the contact details for some of the people who uh, presented and were involved in the work that was presented at the meeting last week that I attended on exosomes. So that's there's you. my answer. There's masses of ways in which people can get into all of this. The book, uh, some of the articles, and I'm pretty certain that Googling um, images and videos on exosomes, you'll find uh, fairly easily the sheer beauty of some of the work that's now coming out with the new microscopic techniques. Very good. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, but we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Thank you.